coming up on Garden Talk. It can cause the tomatoes to split, you know, and that's something that like happens all the times to people and they ask me like, why my tomatoes are splitting, you know? But you have to think that all this vertical space around it, all the walls, fence, anything that it's around could be used to train plants or to grow plants vertically. And you could have a plant with the same exact genetic as the plant that you have like growing. You're watering and like the water uh, splash it back to the leaves and this carry on like uh, any sort of disease yeah, like blight. All we need to nurture the plants. We don't need to apply like anything else, anything specific. They can just thrive by creating the right conditions and leaving, you know, the biodiversity to develop above the soil and under the soil. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 45. In this episode, I interview Alessandro, aka Spicy Mustache. He has been gardening for seven years, and he grows a variety of plants, such as tomatoes, chiles, celery, corn, pumpkins, marigolds, and so much more. In this episode, he talks about how to grow tomatoes from seed all the way to harvest. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I just want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Spider Farmer for sponsoring this podcast. They have board style LED grow lights, bar style LED grow lights, grow tents, inline fans, and carbon filters. They also have complete grow tank kits, which include lighting, a ventilation system, grow pots, a trellis net, a timer, and a monitor for both temperature and humidity. Coupon code MrGrowIt5 will get you a discount on their products, and I'll leave a link to their Amazon store down in the description section below. Big shout out to AC Infinity for sponsoring this podcast. AC Infinity is well known to produce high quality products and provide excellent customer service. They have the thickest grow tent on the market today, inline vans with a controller that can automatically turn on and off according to specific set points. They have seedling mats, trimmers, drying racks, and several other products that you can use in your garden. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is Dutch Pro. They sponsor this podcast and I use their nutrients. I have been using their base nutrients formulated specifically for RO and soft water. I also have been using some of their additives like CalMag, Silica, and their root stimulator called Take Root. They have a few other additives on top of those and pH regulators. Coupon code MrGrow at 10DP will get you a discount on their products. And I'll leave a link to their Amazon store down in the description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Alessandro, aka Spicy Mustache. How are you doing today? Good, good, Chris. And you? I'm doing good. Good. Thanks for asking. I'm excited for this episode. We're going to be talking about growing tomatoes. So really, we're going to be covering from seed all the way to harvest. So I think this is going to be a good beginner-friendly discussion. Uh, not really discussion. I think you're going to be doing most of the talking here. <laughs> Full disclaimer, I uh, don't grow tomatoes right now. I'm looking to grow tomatoes. So I think it's going to be really helpful for me to be able to pick your brain on how to go about it. So that way, when I do go ahead and attempt to grow them, you know, I would have better success rate than if I didn't have this conversation with you. So yeah, really excited for this one. I'll, you know, we kind of talked about this before we recorded is a lot of my audience grows medicinal varieties right now. So as far as coming onto the vegetable side of things, any type of vegetables, whether it be tomatoes, any leafy greens, or just anything beyond that, people are probably a, a large majority of my audience doesn't grow it. Maybe they're beginners, maybe they're looking to grow them or maybe they just started growing them and they're looking for more tips. So again, I think that this conversation is going to be awesome because it's not only going to provide me information on how to do it and help me, but it's also my audience as well. But first things first, let's get into an introduction. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I started as a kid with my grandpa. Um, so I would say probably when I was two or three, 
Uh, I used to spend time with him uh, in the garden uh, until the age of 10. But obviously, I didn't learn that much, you know, even if, like, he taught me pretty much everything about, like, the living soil and how to cooperate with, with nature rather than using, like, chemicals and all these kinds of things. But then um, I had to, you know, leave it a bit on side to dedicate to my career. So I started, um, you know... Um, thinking about tattoos, as you can tell. And and I moved to London. And the first impact with London was, you know, a great city, uh, chaotic. And I really couldn't find a place where, you know, to spend time and disconnect, you know, and like be a bit more in touch with nature, you know, even if, you know, it's one of the greenest city in the world. So, uh, so what I did, like I started, I, I got really interested in uh, growing vegetable. And I started on a balcony at first. Um, but it was, you know, it was something really small and it was mm, most case scenario was like seeds that I bought from the store. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, I finished to eat a chili or something. I would split it up, you know, and plant the seeds. But then, um, I got more interest into it. Like, and I was like, I need to know more and more. So I started researching and studying, you know, different techniques of growing food. And I moved to a house with a bigger garden. And I started planting and planting. My first year was a bit of a disaster because I couldn't really grow many things. Uh, but then, you know, like by failing, I learned a lot. Uh, even if I could read the same exact thing on a book, I had to try it myself, you know. Um, and yeah, I moved roughly five or six times, uh, like over the course of seven years. And each time I had to carry my glass greenhouse, my soil, raised beds, everything, everything like to a new garden, to a new growing space. But yeah, uh, now I got to a point that uh, I moved to a house and I've been here for like three years. Um, and yeah, I managed to grow a lot of food, especially during the full season. I can provide something like 50, 60 percent for myself and my girlfriend of like the total uh, need of like vegetables. So, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That's how I started and like where I am right now. Awesome. And now you also have a YouTube channel, which is very popular. You have over 25,000 subscribers, very good quality videos. I enjoy them. Yeah. I'm really interested in uh, photography and videography as well. Uh, so over the past 18 months, I've been learning editing videos and like, um, you know, um, pictures and all these kind of things. I do it every night after my full-time job. And yeah, and I started the channel a bit as a joke, but then uh, I really enjoyed explaining people how to grow their own food in an organic way, you know? So, so yeah, now I do it like every single week I post a new video on the channel. That's awesome. Congrats on all your success so far. It was actually a viewer that commented on one of my videos and recommended that I, I talk to you on a oh. podcast episode. So that's how that's all we're here today. So thank you to that viewer that recommended Alessandro to come on here. So oh, for that. <laughs> cool. So what would you say before we get deep into tomatoes? What would you say is your style of gardening? I mean, are you an indoor grower, outdoor? Do you grow in soil, cocoa, hydroponics? Are you organic or synthetic? What's your growth style? So um, I do I do everything mostly outdoor, except if, like growing gourmet mushrooms or microgreens that I do it indoor. Uh, but other than that, I prefer to, you know, I tried hydroponic, I tried different styles, but no offense for all the growers doing hydroponic. I still love it, you know, but I feel more connected to to nature whenever i put my hands into the soil you know so i started making my own uh mix of like you know i was researching how to create the perfect mix uh, adding perlite or um adding uh war, co war casting uh, compost in the right ratio and all that but then at some point <coughs> sorry i met uh charles dowding which is an amazing grower in uk who invented a method called an Nordic gardening, which basically means that um, so you can grow in any area, even if you have weeds or grass growing, you just need to apply a layer of cardboard in the case that you have weeds or grass. And, and if not, you can do it without the cardboard and wet the cardboard and then add a 15 centimeters of compost and that's a fully organic method that you, it's a minimal disturbance. So you don't dig 
as the name implies, uh, you just simply, I use a dibber, which is um, a wooden uh, sort of uh, thick stick that I use to, to create a hole. And then I plant the plant without even uh, tapping the soil around it, but literally just leaving the plant to uh, settle the roots whenever I water. And so a minimal disturbance in it. And what I do, it's 100% organic. I try to use different techniques, including permaculture. So the closed loop system, I, I don't have any wastage in the, in the garden. And also um, I use Jadam, which is a Korean natural farming. And so I, I try to, you know, use what's cheap and available around my area and convert it into things that I can, you know, valuable things that I can use in the garden to grow food. That's awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of things that are real environmentally friendly, which is awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. That's the goal. Let's get into the variety of tomatoes. I think that's one thing that you mentioned that you wanted to talk about to kind of begin. You know, I watched a couple of videos you have on tomatoes. You have some beautiful harvests of tomatoes with a whole bunch of different varieties. Can you talk to us about the different varieties of tomatoes, you know, determinate versus indeterminate, so on and so forth? So, yeah, um, in most case scenario, whenever you buy a packet of seeds, it should say um, determinate or indeterminate varieties uh, at the back. So determinate means uh, simply like uh, a plant that grows to a set of uh, leaves and fruit. So, so it doesn't grow too tall. And also whenever it reaches the um, right height, it, you don't have to do anything else. It just stops. And it produces most of the fruits at once. Uh, so the cool thing about this variety is that you don't have to prune. You don't have to remove the suckers, for example. I'm going to get to the suckers as well. I'm going to explain what it is. And, and also, um, yeah, it's for people that don't want to take too much space in the garden. You know, it could be for a variety of reasons. Uh, and then we got indeterminate varieties, which means that it's a plant that it doesn't grow to a set height, but it keeps growing and it keeps producing suckers. So it needs a constant pruning and tall trellis. So, so you don't, you know, break the plants because break the plants for the uh, weight of the fruit that keeps growing. And yeah, I personally prefer to grow indeterminate varieties, but they're both really great. Uh, it's just because I prefer to prune and guide the plant like on trellis for the whole season and having something that keeps producing at different times rather than having like a, you know, a huge harvest all at once. Okay, that makes sense. So once growers have an understanding of that, you know, you can either start from by planting seeds or by buying a plant from a local nursery. Can you talk to us yeah. about, you know, some of the differences, maybe like pros and cons, you know, of buying seeds or actually getting seeds from a tomato and then planting it uh, versus buying at your local nursery? you have any tips on any of that? Yeah. Um, so for any grower, I would discourage them from buying plants i did it before but from buying plants from the nursery just because uh you don't know how they grow them so potentially they could have to add like you know um chemicals or slow release fertilizer anything that you're not aware of so like the best advice and also more satisfying is to start from seed all the times i try to grow mostly heritage varieties uh, there are different kinds of seeds as well. Uh, like you can find hybrids, you can find seeds that are open pollinated, which means that like uh, uh, it's not like uh, you you're not assured that the year after you're gonna have the same exact plant, but you could have something a bit different. Or you can buy heritage varieties, which are varieties that basically like they manage to stabilize like and have like um, uh, a variety that it was like with good qualities or anything like that, that it's passed on from generation after generation. And this is the one, like the old, I mean, the varieties that in my opinion are worth saving seeds as well. And, uh, you know, passing on as well, this uh, seed sovereignty. Um, yeah, it's something that it's really, really important uh, in the modern society because like big companies try to, uh, you know, uh, take away the confidence from the farmers 
So this means like refers or to refer all the times to the expert, you know, and and so uh, the farmer uh, is not so it's deprived from confidence. And all the times that like he needs to grow, or even like the small grower, not necessarily like the farmer. And all the times that you need to grow something, like you refer to to whoever it says that knows, you know, better than you. But um, yeah, it's something that you know, um, yeah, a hundred percent. Like you learn much more if you start from seed rather than like a plant that you buy from from the nursery, you know. Okay. So yeah. you've bought your seeds or you've gotten seeds from a tomato ready to plant into a mix. You talked a little bit about the mix that you use. Can we get a little bit deeper into it? So, you know, what's an ideal mix, an ideal soil for tomatoes to be grown in? Yeah, so tomatoes are heavy feeders. So this means that, like, they require a lot of feed to grow. Um, so I would recommend either, like, planting, like, companion plants. So using plants that work, you know, uh, in kind of, of a symbiotic effect with um, with a tomato. So they help the plant to grow and they help each other. Or to use a mix that has like a good ratio of like a compost and worm casting, you know. So something that like the tomato can feed whenever they need to. Uh, or like, as I said before, I use the Nordic method, which is straight compost. So I don't add anything else rather than compost. And uh, like whenever the plants need needs it, you know, they can just take whatever nutrient they need and like and keep growing. Or alternatively, you can use uh, even like um, so uh, like feeding like tea, you know, like warm, like you, for example, you grab the warm casting, you put it in a bucket and you add like a, an air pump and you let it go for 24 hours. And then all the microbial activity, the microorganism keeps multiplying and then you can apply to the soil and transfer all these beneficial microorganisms and, uh, you know, nutrients to the soil. So, yeah, there are options. Like, if you are a beginner, I would say, I would suggest to not make it overcomplicated. Just go to the, your local garden center, ask for an organic premix, and you can start from there. Then, you know, if you get passionate, if you get... Uh, like um, really into gardening, then you can start, you know, planning on how to make your own or different techniques on, on how to make it, you know. I think that's really good advice, you know, especially for beginners. A yeah. lot of folks will start off with that bagged soil, that bagged mix. Here over in the States, very popular is Fox Farm Ocean Forest Soil, Fox Farm Happy yeah. Frog, Roots Organic. So are you saying that they could start in any one of those bagged soils and then kind of improve from there? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Or even for um, like, you know, if you manage to make your own compost at home, you can start like using that just try compost. So, so yeah, easy as that. Reducing your wastage and reusing it into the garden, you know? Okay. And then as far as a container size to plant into, you know, a lot of my audience is home growers, indoors. You can either plant in containers. I know that you use raised beds outdoors. Yeah. Can you talk to us about containers? Like what's like the smallest container size that you can successfully grow tomatoes in without worrying about, you know, problems happening because they're in too small of a container? Yeah. So, uh, there are loads, loads of information online, like different recommendations on how to grow there and like what size to use and all different advices, you know, but I tried it myself. Uh, in many, many different containers and even like a, a 15, 20 liters container, it's more than enough to uh, start, you know, growing a plant and bring it to fruit, you know. It's it's a plant that literally like, it's really resilient and it grows even if you make like many damages to the roots or the plant itself, it's going to keep growing, especially in determinate varieties. So uh, that's why I highly recommend it for a beginner, you know. So it's it's great to to experiment, you know. Even if you have, I, I saw many people using like now um, air pots or um, fabric pots, uh, which is what I use if I'm growing tomatoes in container, and and they work great because yeah, you have a lot of aeration at the root level, and you don't have like. Uh, issues like um, uh, the level of moisture too high 
like uh, most beginners have, you know, like that's the most common issue, like overwatering. So, so yeah, uh, I would suggest you to experiment with like fabric pot or air pot and yeah. Now, transplanting. Let's get a little bit into that because I know for indoor growers in particular, a lot of people are limited on space. And you've done actually you've done several videos on how to grow in small spaces and stuff like that. But let, let's say hypothetically they're starting in a small container, right? So they have their seedling in a small container. It sprouts. At what point would you transplant into a larger container? And then would you transplant multiple times? Like with some other plants, some folks will go from like a small solo cup to a one gallon container up to their final container, which three gallons, five gallons, seven gallons, so on and so forth. Talk to us about transplanting a little bit with tomatoes. Okay, so so the first rule to check when your plant is ready to be transplanted is to, so there are some drainage uh, holes at the bottom. So you, literally you can just uh, lift the plant and check at the bottom. If there are some roots poking, poking out, uh, this means, uh, or, even worse, if the roots are poking up, so above the soil, this means that like the root mass doesn't have enough space to grow. So it's looking for new space. Uh, and so what you need to do is to uh, move it to a new container. Um, and this is why, another reason why I don't recommend buying plants from the nursery, because most case scenario, they are root bounded, which means that the plant, they left it to grow too much in the same container. So the roots took the shape of the container and now like it, it's, uh, it's almost a concrete mass that it's, it's hard to break. And so the, the roots can suffocate themselves. So the best thing, uh, coming back to transplanting, is to transplant a tomato plant as deep as possible. So you can go straight into a big container. So what I do usually, I start in a small pot, even... Um, let's say plastic cup size. And from there, I go straight into my raised bed. Um, well, what you need to do is to, well, break the root mass. If it's it, like, like we said, if it's too tangled up, uh, don't be scared of like breaking it because as I said, it's a really resilient plant. It's most people, you know, they remove a few roots and they're worried that they damage the plant, but no, you can, you can remove as many roots as you want, except that you don't, you don't remove them completely. And then if you check along the plant, along the main stem, there are some whiter, and those whiter are called um, trichomes. And they could be uh, glandular trichomes or non-glandular trichomes. So glandular, glandular trichomes are basically, um, uh, they, they turn both, first of all, into roots, new roots. So this means, this is why I'm saying like plant it as deep as possible because all this white hair, they're gonna turn into, into roots. I usually remove the bottom leaves and I plant it really deep. So then all this white hair turn into roots and you're gonna have like a really solid, you know, root system and the plants can grow pretty big. Um, and they also help the plant to be protected from uh, rain or, uh, you know, climate and from uh, pests. So, so that they got different function, these trichomes. Uh, so, so you can go straight, uh, as I say, into a big container. There is no need to transplant into a medium one, a, a bigger one and a bigger one. And, and yeah, and the plant, uh, yeah, gonna develop super quick because uh, I saw tomatoes literally like growing that I was going into the garden one day and they were 10 centimeters and the day after, like they were, 15, 20 centimeters. And I was like, what, you know, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, and, and it's so satisfying to see this plant growing as well. I, I, it's one of my favorite. Let's switch it up. Let's talk about feeding nutrients or fertilizing the plant, right? So let's say they start in that small container, they transplant it into a larger container or their raised bed. At some point, I assume that the, the soil is going to be depleted of the nutrients that it needs to grow, right? So at, at what point would they feed and what would they feed? Um, so what I used to feed the tomatoes, um, it's, uh, you would, as I said, you could, uh, grab this, uh, bag of soil, uh, premix, uh, like there was a brand, I don't remember the name now, but basically, um, it was, uh, pre-made with all the nutrients start to finish for a plant. 
So you don't have to do anything else at that point, which is great for someone like starting to to feed a plant, to grow a plant. Or alternatively, you know, um, you can uh, use uh, something that, like, you know, I don't really like to buy things or that are claimed to be organic from the shop because loads of companies claim it to be like an organic feed for plants. But in the end, you know, it's, it's not, it's just it's something that you can make at home, for example, to feed a tomato plant. If you finish your, uh, your season and you have like, um, an older tomato plant, you can cut it and chop it down into pieces, put it into a bucket, go to your local woods and grab some, you know, leaf mold, which is the leaves, the like drops, leaves and stems, the drops from, uh, from the trees and turn into this uh, dark brown uh, golden fertilizer. You grab one handful, you put it into a bucket along with the, all those break it, broken down, you know, stems and part of the plant. And then you add unchlorinated water or rainwater. Unchlorinated means simply like water that it stands outside, outdoor. Uh, or with the cup open, so you give the uh, chance to, like, the excess of chlorine to evaporate. Not all of it, because obviously plants still need chlorine to grow. Um, and, yeah, and that's one of the best feeds that you can use for, for a tomato plant. Because if you think about it, like, uh, a, a tomato plant, whenever it's fully mature, has already everything that it's required for the plant to grow. There is nothing else that it requires. It's all inside the plant. So adding this component into the uh, bucket with water, you add these microorganisms from the forest floor that they're going to break down all these um, micro and macronutrients and they're going to make it available again for the plant to be absorbed. So this is something like a really super easy fertilizer that summer anyone can make at home. Yeah. I was going to say that's, that sounds really easy. <laughs> you explained yeah, it in yeah. such a, a way that makes it easy, you know. If anyone wants to know more, by the way, it's called uh, Jadam Liquid Fertilizer. And you can find in Korean Natural Farming. There is a book called Jadam that you can buy. It's a great book. Awesome. So you talked a little bit about water. Um, you know, you said rainwater or dechlorinated water. But how about the actual watering process? You know, some plants, it's so easy to overwater. Do you have any tips for watering or any just general advice? Yeah, so a really cool tip uh, that I learned, if you're watering like pots, uh, it's either to like stick your finger into the soil and like take it out and like try to, to feel like how moist is the finger. If it feels completely dry, obviously you need to water the plant. And if not, uh, like you can wait to, to water it. You can hold on because the plant is going to access that all the moisture that it's in the pot, it doesn't need to be at the bottom, at the top, midway. It can access all of it. But the roots are gonna extend to get into it and like, and they're gonna absorb that moisture. Or alternatively, like whenever you transplant your plant and you put it into your container, the first thing that you need to do is to lift your container and you feel the weight. You know, it's something that it takes, you know, it takes a bit of time to learn, but you lift your container and you feel the weight. So then you water it and you lift it again and you can feel the difference. So then whenever your plant feels light again, I mean, as light as when you transplanted it, it's time to water your plant. So that could be an easy tip that anyone, you know, could use to, to, to water a plant. But for tomatoes, it's really important that you have a constant watering of the plant, because if you don't have a co constant moisture for the plant, basically you can, you can have different issues like, uh, like there is a tension on the skin of the tomatoes. Uh, so uh, if you alter this, uh, you know, watering period between like uh, giving water to the plant and waiting, I mean, if you're not constant in giving water to the plant, like this uh, tension uh, could make the tomato split because the plant is not used anymore to like that moisture. And whenever you apply it again after a, a drought or after a period that you didn't water, it can cause the tomatoes to split, you know, and that's that's something that like happens all the time to people. And they ask me like, why my tomatoes are splitting, you know, uh, but it's yeah, it's not 
so easy to learn like when when to water like um, a tomato plant but there are tricks like I like I said the weight or mulching mulching it's another great tip so you can just grab like straw wood chips or anything which is organic because I don't like to use inorganic you know uh, mulching even if uh, like at the shop you can buy them anywhere um, you apply to the to the surface of your plant after after you water and basically what happens they're gonna retain moisture first of all they're gonna protect the microorganisms in your soil so they don't get uh, disturbed and and also you can get some like um, I've got a mineralized um, straw that uh, every time I water it it slowly release minerals into the soil which is a win-win you know yeah a lot of those things that you mentioned are very similar to growing medicinal varieties. It's funny because, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of my viewers do grow medicinal varieties. And so I feel like as we continue to talk on, a lot of folks are going to be able to catch on pretty easily and be able to have that transition easily and be more successful on their first grow since it is so similar. So that's pretty cool to hear. Let's switch it up. Let's talk about training and pruning. Important things, certainly. Can you talk to us about training and pruning tomatoes in order to maximize yield? Yeah, sure. So what I usually, what I normally use is uh, bamboo sticks just to like, you know, uh, start uh, the plant uh, like growing it straight. But I sell crazy things, not, not so crazy, but like people growing it upside down, which is really cool. It's something that you can do 100%. Uh, you can grow the plant upside down and they're just going to produce the roots at the top. So you don't have to, you know, to use any sort of trellis. But another thing that I use other than bubble sticks, it's uh, metal wire. So you can just um, twist the metal wire around the bamboo stick and then uh, go along like, I don't know, a structure of your greenhouse or your fence or, you know, anything that it's a vertical space and fix it with a, like some staple or something like that. And uh, the plant is going to grow along that. You can just, you know, use... Um, so twine or like cotton twine is best like around it. So so you support this growth. But I also uh, I also suggest to make DIY in a trellis. I made a lot of them. Like if anyone is interested, you can find them in on my channel. And it's just um, with timbers you build a structure and then you use cotton twine to support the plant. Uh, obviously use it like double because if you use a single twine it's gonna it's just gonna break and and the cool thing about cotton twine is that at the end whenever you finish to you grow your plant you can just cut it at the base with like uh, including the cotton one, twine and everything and just compost everything because it's compostable you know and then make it again for the for the season after and if you if you use uh things like um uh to impermeable uh, to make like the wood impermeable it's, uh, you know, it's perfect because it's going to last you like probably four or five years. And with a bit of DIY, I was really bad with DIY, but I learned, you know, thanks to YouTube, thanks to books, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you could potentially use that to, to support your plant and make it grow vertical, you know. Especially in an urban garden like, like the one that I have, uh, it's super easy. Like most people, you know, think about the space. Uh, having a horizontal perspective, you know, but you have to think that all those vertical space around it, all the walls, fence, anything that it's around could be used to train plants or to grow plants vertically, you know. So, so yeah, the, that's a trick that you could potentially use. Okay, now how about topping that technique? Yeah. Can you talk to us about topping tomatoes? Yeah, topping, as I mentioned before, or uh, it's also uh, called removing suckers. The suckers are basically like, so you have the tomato plant growing, you have the, your main stem, and then you got the branches poking out. And then from uh, the intersection between the main stem and the branch, all the times you're going to see these stems growing out, that they look different from a branch and they look more like the top of the plant. So all these stems are suckers, where, which is the plant that is just trying to you know, grow new branches to expand, you know, and, and produce more fruit. So all you need to do, especially for indeterminate varieties, for determinate varieties, 
most case scenario, you don't have to do it. But for indeterminate, you need to cut it off, uh, but you don't have to chuck it away because that's a cool thing. So by, by doing this, you can just, you know, remove the lower leaves of this um, sucker poking out and stick it in a glass of water. And all these trichomes that we mentioned before, they're going to produce roots. And you're going to have a plant, with, a plant with the same exact genetic as the plant that you have, like, growing. So this means I do it every year for, like, either to give it away to all my neighbors that everyone is asking me all the time. Or to, uh, you know, having a backup. Because you never know, like, something could go wrong. And if some, anything goes wrong, you still got the same uh, exact plant growing in a smaller size, but still, you know, the same, the same genetic. So if it was an amazing plant that you had outdoor and you were like really happy with it, you can still have a becca with the same exact genetic. And also another thing about like pruning this plant is that once they reach, I would say something around 60 centimeters, 50 centimeters, you need to prune the bottom part of the uh, plant. So this means remove all the lower leaves because whenever you water uh, your um, soil around the plant most of the disease comes from the soil and what happens is that there is a bouncing back effect so so you're you're watering and like the water uh, splashes back to the leaves and this carry on like uh, any sort of disease like blight you know or anything that could damage your plant so, so you, by removing them, first of all, you improve uh, the airflow of uh, like uh, the air circulation, especially if you have many plants growing in a line. And, and also you encourage the plants to redirect all the energies back to the top, like into the fruit or into the vegetative stage. So this means like uh, growing like uh, in, um, in size, you know. So, so yeah, these are just two of the tricks that like you, you could use. And also another great thing about the mulching the method that I mentioned is by doing this, other than retaining the moisture and protecting your micro and microorganisms, you are uh, limiting the bouncing it back effect because obviously you have something on top of the soil. So, you know, like this water, like every time you water in your, your, around your tomato is not bouncing up that much, but it's kind of like, you know, just settling down. So much good information. <laughs> you touched upon a couple problems that could potentially happen. Yeah. Another problem that I want to dive deeper into is pests, right? So can you talk about what you do in order to prevent pests from invading, yeah. invading your garden? <laughs> so, um, so first of all, as I said, um, I'm an organic rover, so, so I don't use any chemical. So uh, there are different techniques. So the first one is to make an homemade liquid. So what I do at the beginning of the season, I go out to the local park, make sure that it's like check with the council if they sprayed it with some nasty, you know, like chemicals or whatever, because most of, most of the times they do it. So you just go there, you look for nettles, like the young ones, not the old ones, and you cut them at the base. Uh, and these nettles, like other than being like, bad whenever you touch them that are also really bad for pests you know they they tend to stay away from it so what i do i grab a cheesecloth i grab all these nettles like these uh, new shots i chop it down into small pieces and then i add some crushed garlic which is also really good to repel pests and i and i leave uh, all this into into a cheesecloth and into the water into a bucket of water for probably like three to four weeks infusing and after three to four weeks you can use it straight to spray your plants top and bottom and, and this is good you know as a prevention but uh, the main thing that you should use is companion planting, which is like the best, best thing to use in, in any sort of garden. So for a tomato, there are a few plants that you can use, like um, marigolds uh, are really good because uh, they repel uh, green and black flies, like or from anyone that don't, doesn't know like what are green and black flies, they are aphids. Um, and yeah, you can use uh, this plant. They are really, really effective. You can either plant them all around the tomato plant and they create a sort of barrier, which is 
uh, deceiving for the pests, you know. They, they, they cannot tell if there is a tomato behind it because the smell is too, is too strong for them. Um, and I recommend to plant them three weeks in advance because another cool thing that the marigold um, does with the tomato is they create a symbiotic relationship between the roots of the marigolds and the tomatoes and uh, they repel uh, so that dangerous nematodes. So there are cool nematodes, let's call them like that, that you can use in the garden and they are good to you know, repel some kind of pest, but there are also like bad nematodes that could create damages to your plant and any, any sort of bad thing that could happen to your plant. And another plant that I used in uh, in combo with the tomato is basil, which is which is great. Well, uh, I usually tend to pair the plants that they are. If you think about it, basil and tomato are pairing perfectly in a kitchen. So why not pair, pairing them in the garden? You know, and like they are they are great because they cooperate and they. Um, repel like not only green and black, black flies but also white flies and all the kind of pests you know and yeah and this plant can be interplanted between the lines of tomatoes or even if you have a pot you know you can plant it there it's not gonna develop fully but still you know I used to have it like I used to clone uh, basil which is which is super easy you can just snip off uh, the tops and the same as uh, suckers stick into the water and they're gonna produce new roots and then you transplant it into the soil and you can have them like in small pots and I used to place them around the garden even like if they were not planted into the soil but like uh, around a pot or or like just around the base of a tomato and they help to repel all these nasty pests you know um, <coughs> And another thing that it's amazing to use in the garden is nasturtium. Uh, it's, a, it's a plant that is fully edible. So roots, stems, leaves, uh, flowers, anything from this plant is edible. It's a bit of a peppery flavor, so not everyone likes it, but you can get used to it because it's really versatile in the kitchen. You can make so many things. But the cool thing, it's called a sacrificial plant. So what I do, like... Uh, Let's say I dedicate a raised bed to uh, tomatoes. I plant a pot with an asturtium close by, and this plant is going to attract all the black flies. And, and then, uh, so they're going all on the plant because they prefer an asturtium rather than like uh, your main crops. And, and then you can simply, whenever they're full of pests, you can simply get rid of your nasturtium. And this is why it's called a sacrificial plant. But it's, it's amazing because thanks to... This combination of plant, you can, you know, have a natural pest control. They also, I also leave a few basil plants to flower and they attract beneficial pollinators like, I don't know, uh, ladybugs or lacewings that they feed on uh, green and black flies. And, um, you know, all this co cooperation allows me to not use anything at all. Like, there is a cool thing, a cool sentence that is mentioned in the Korean natural farming, which is, do as nature does, which means, uh, like, cooperating with nature, because it provides already all we need to nurture the plants. We don't need to apply, like, anything else, anything specific. They can just thrive by creating the right conditions and leaving, you know, the biodiversity to develop above the soil and under the soil gotcha yeah let's talk about the transition to flower you know flowering yeah. bloom the fruiting stage so tomato plants they have male and female parts on the same plant and they need to really be we often call on the medicinal side of things pollinated right can you talk to us about the whole transitioning the flower process you know how to pollinate and so on and so forth so tomato plant, like when, whenever they reach maturity, as you say, like they, they develop flowers and, and these flowers, they're going to develop into fruit. So um, most case scenario, if you have them outdoor, you create the right conditions, you attract pollinators and these pollinators, they all, they do the work. They do the job. Like you don't need to do anything. They just jump from one flower to another and they pollinate your plants. But if this doesn't happen, let's say you have them inside a greenhouse or, uh, you know, like they're not easily accessible for pollinators, you can hand pollinate. 
So you can just simply shake these flowers, like uh, like literally shake them like that, and they drop all this pollen that then gets released and it, and it goes on the other flowers. And this is uh, like so easy, like doing so, like uh, they start like uh, uh, pollinating all the other flowers and you're going to have fruits developing. So it's it's like one of the easiest thing to do. But also like if you are feeding your plant with a specific feeding, I don't know, like you were using like a, a vegetative um, feeding. So to allow so fully nitrogen to help the plant uh, develop uh, in size, uh, you need to swap to something that uh, is made for um, you know flowers to the develop of fruit. So lower in nitrogen, a bit higher in phosphorus, potassium, and uh, uh, other micronutrients that you can find in uh, um, in uh, nutrients bolts from the store. Okay. Yeah. And then, so tomatoes are growing on the plant, right? At what point do you harvest? You know, when, when do you harvest plants? You should always harvest them whenever they're fully ripe. So whenever they are, like most case scenario, you're going to see a tomato that turns completely red. But I'm growing varieties, for example, there are heirloom varieties that are called Black Beauty. And they develop whenever they are Bordeaux, like really dark red. You know, so it's, it's kind of hard to tell. But... Um, so that's the ideal stage to, from when to harvest your tomato. But if you happen to harvest them whenever they're still green because of the conditions that I mentioned, uh, you can just bring them indoor and there are ways of turning them into chutney, or, which, is, which is good. It's not as good as like fully ripe tomatoes, but it's still good. Or you can, a trick that I tried and it works, you can wrap them in a, a newspaper and leave it inside a box in the dark uh, and like, uh, thanks to like, you know, to the darkness and because they got disconnected from the plant and all that, like they slowly ripe. It's not a hundred percent of the times that it happens. I heard people that they, uh, put like the tomato close to, uh, bananas or, uh, apples, you know, and that helps the transition, like to the tomato to, to ripe. I tried it. It didn't work. Maybe it was me, but. You know, like for me, it didn't work. Uh, and so this trick, like of wrapping them, works great, you know. And um, yeah, I know it's not the ideal way of like when picking your tomatoes, but still, like if it happens that you're growing them and then you're like, oh, such a shame that I can't, you know, make them fully ripe and take them indoor, you can still, you know, do something about that. Okay, that makes sense. So even if they're not fully ripe, you can still pick them and, and, you know, they'll actually ripen if you're in a desperate situation to where you can't wait until the very end or you're getting that cold weather or so on and so forth. So that's good to know. Let's, uh, let's talk about problems. So there are so many different problems that you could run into. There's three that I kind of want to highlight that I was hoping you'd be able to talk about. Uh, number one being powdery mildew. Number two being blossom end rot. And number two, Three, which you've already kind of touched on, is the skin splitting. Can you talk to us about those things? Yeah, so the most common thing that could happen to your tomato plant, at least in uh, if you have similar weather like UK, which is you know really humid, or or if you recreate these conditions by, for example, watering a lot or uh, like not having something like a, a, enough drainage in your soil that allows the moisture to drain out. It's blight, it's tomato blight. Like this past season, we had, you know, like it was a drama for all the growers here in the UK. Everyone had issues with uh, with this blight because it, it affects the plant. So it's basically the plant starts rotting. So you're going to notice it from the main stem. There are parts of the main stem that turn into, uh, they turn completely black and they slowly spread and they go into the fruit and into the leaves and the whole plant get affected and you can just simply you know say goodbye to your plant because that's the end of it there are like there are um old methods claim to work but they only work to slow down the spread of the blight they don't get rid of the blight so you know in that case you you can't really do much about that and and you know that's it you you need to chuck away the plant but uh one thing that i discovered uh, i would say one year ago 
that I wasn't aware of is that most people like tend to burn the plant because they're worried, you know, that you're going to have blight this, the, the season after. But as talking again with this Charles Dowden, that it's sort of my mentor uh, in, uh, in growing plants, he explained to me that like you can easily compost it and like add the affected uh, parts of the plant into the compost because they thrive only with organic matter. And so after like four months or three months or something like that, it depends on the growing conditions, on, on the climate and many things, they're just going to die off. And, and, you know, and you don't have to um, worry that much that the year after you're going to spread this blight uh, all over your garden, which is a great thing because, you know, like you would think like, ah, oh, I wasted not only the plant, but also the plant material. I'm going to have to chuck it away. But then again, we have this closed loop that we can save, like, you know, the plant material and um, yeah, reuse it into the garden. Um, but yeah, you could potentially have <clears throat> other issues affecting the plant. As I said, like uh, if you're not constant in watering, you have the splitting of the tomato skin, and which ruins the fruit. Uh, you can still eat it, but you know it's like the plant is ruined because you know you're gonna have um not that regular nice shape and tasty tomatoes that you could have had like if you maintained you know and a nice uh, st schedule like in watering your plant um but yeah that's that's pretty much it like i mean the problems that you could have like on on a plant yeah okay lots yeah. of good information lots of good information in this entire episode i'm super glad that you uh that you came on here and spilled your knowledge to all of us yeah. wrapping things up how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Yeah, so um, I've got a book coming that is coming in around March, and it's gonna it's gonna be all about urban gardening and uh, how to grow food in either a small space, big space, no matter where you live. Uh, I explain different techniques about Korean natural farming. Uh, you can find it in the book. I won't spoil it. Uh, and then um, you can find me on my YouTube channel, Spicy Mustache uh or instagram and plans for the futures are really exciting collaboration that i still didn't announce but i'm gonna announce it now with bbc uh i'm doing an introduction video for uh sir david attenborough and for his new series and also um potentially being on a tv series so let's see let's see let's see what the future brings but those are the plans yeah that's awesome that's so cool. Yeah, I saw in your about section, I mean, you've been seen on many different areas, the Guardian newspaper, Wales Online, Lad Bible, Good News Network. So you're featured in so many different areas. That's yeah. awesome. Especially during lockdown, there was a period of time that everyone was interested in growing food, you know, we saw a boom into the gardening community and everyone was like, oh, how do you do that? How do you do that? You know? And so, yeah. That makes sense. Well, I'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the description section below if you are on YouTube. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. I try to get as many thumbs up as possible. YouTube will recommend this video more. The more thumbs up we get, the more comments we get. Let us know down in the comment section below, what do you do when you grow your tomatoes? I like to go down in the comment section and see some various tips. Maybe there's something that Alessandro didn't cover that, that you do. Uh, let us know down in the comment section below. If you're tuned in on one of the podcast platforms, particularly Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. Coming close to 200 ratings and reviews, so I'd love to hit that number potentially by the end of the year. Thank you to everyone who has left a rating and review so far. Alessandro, thank you so much for coming on to this podcast. You, this has brother. been awesome. Much appreciated. And awesome. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And you too, man. Thank you. Thank you for having Thanks. me.